Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kelly of Lean Frontiers, and I will serve as your host today. Just a few points of logistics before we get started. Today's short presentation is being recorded, so look for an email shortly after this recording with a link to view the session on demand. Please share it with those in your organization and perhaps even use the recording as part of a lunch and learn. Due to the short nature of this webinar, we will not be fielding questions. If you do have questions, our presenter will share their email address and you can email the presenter directly. Today's webinar is lead up for the Lean Accounting Summit, which takes place September 11th through 13th in Austin, Texas. Please consider joining us for this event as we have an incredible lineup of speakers you're not going to want to miss. You will be hearing from many thought leaders, including today's presenter. You can learn more about the summit by visiting leanfrontiers.com forward slash L-A-M-S registration forward slash. So with that said, let me introduce our presenter today, Dorsey Sherman. Dorsey is the founder and principal of Model Consulting. She teaches and coaches organizations to reach their full potential by practicing scientific thinking and strategy development. She has been practicing Toyota Takata for three years and works to adopt the routine in every aspect of her life, including coaching leaders, building her business, and parenting her two girls. She will be co-hosting Katacon 6 in Austin. So for now, I'll hand it over to Dorsey. Thanks, Kelly, and hi, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. And um, yeah, my company is called Model Consulting, which is hard to pronounce, but it, it means pattern in French. So those of you that are Kata um, geeks or Kata practitioners, you'll, you'll realize the significance of that um, word pattern in terms of improvement. So as Kelly said, I've been practicing Toyota Kata for about three years um, as a learner, as a coach, as a second coach. And recently I realized kind of an interesting crossover between scientific thinking and Toyota Kata and emotional intelligence and positive psychology. And there's really power in the Toyota Kata practice routine, not just for improving process, but for improving and developing ourselves. And because we bring our whole selves to work, you know, we're not a work person and a home person, we bring our whole selves to work, personal and professional development are completely intertwined and, and really go hand in hand as we strive for the best version of ourselves, our relationships and the impact that we have at work will all benefit positively. So well, it's common uh, during a lean journey to really look outside ourselves at how an organization and employees need to change. I believe that lean leadership starts with looking in the mirror and specifically, what do I need to do differently to get different results? In my definition of a lean leader is one that practices humility and curiosity, hope and compassion, but it's really what's your definition? And from there, consider where are you now? What are your thoughts, your behaviors, your values and your beliefs that make up your current condition? And where do you hope to be as a leader? What are the obstacles keeping you from that new condition and, and what is your next step? But before I get into that, let me talk about my slides are not advancing. There we go, sorry. Okay, first let me start with a brief overview of Toyota Kata. So Mike Rother studied Toyota and looked at how people were thinking and behaving on a daily basis. And he found that workers daily habits looked like scientific thinking conducting experiments, reflecting on learning, and when what they thought was going to happen was different than what actually happened, and, and that managers were teachers of that way. But he also realized that scientific thinking is not our default mode. As humans, our brains have evolved to jump to conclusions, make assumptions about situations when we have no facts or data. And he understood that to learn new skills and, and really um, tagging on to all the research on brain science is that how we learn new skills, in this case solving problems, must be through practice and specifically deliberate practice which is with a coach. And so Toyota Kata is really the combination of scientific thinking paired with deliberate practice. And that's the unique and interesting thing about Toyota Kata. It combines what we need to learn with in terms of how to achieve innovative goals with how to go about learning it. So this is the four-step pattern. Um, understand, step one is understand the direction or the challenge. 
Step two, grasp the current condition. Step three, set your next target condition. And step four is uh, experimenting your way forward. And while this looks simple and common sense, it is not common practice. And the pattern is intentionally designed to offset the weaknesses of human problem solving. Because what do we do? We go right to step four and immediately start eating and don't even really think of it as experiments, but put solutions in place kind of randomly um, based on our assumption and our bias. And so this process is kind of extra extrapolated from years of observing how workers are, are thinking and acting. And most typically it's used um, to solve process problems in terms of manufacturing, healthcare, service industries, but it is a meta skill and can be applied to any improvement that you seek. And so today, I really want to talk about using this four-step model to develop yourself. So during Mike Rother's keynote at Katakan 5 last year, this was one of his, his opening slides. And for me, it, it really struck me because, of course, I knew Lean was about PDCA and scientific thinking and hypothesis. But, and for me, that meant experimentation, facts and data forming hypothesis, but I hadn't really thought about scientific thinking in quite this way, which is to say, don't believe your thoughts. Don't believe what you think. And, and in Mike Rother's words, he said, a lesson of the story is that a thought is not a fact. A thought is not a fact. You have to test it. So to further this point, everyone who attended Katakan last year got the sticker and it said, don't be so sure. And so from the perspective of process improvement and problem solving, the PDCA cycle record is a specific uh, tool really to test ideas. So you write down what is your next step and then you say, what do you expect to happen? You then take the step and then compare uh, what actually happened, so the facts, to what you expected. And so that's a way to prove or disprove ideas, you know, and to kind of put on your stake in the ground of, of what you thought was going to happen and see whether it did. And it, it either validates the idea or disproves the idea, which is when more learning occurs. But for me, I saw really an additional meaning and application. So I've been doing a lot of training and um, reading in the fields of emotional intelligence and positive psychology and really the research behind how and why people change and really change. And the foundation of those fields of study is that thoughts cause your emotion and that that emotion leads to your behavior, which creates results and outcomes in your life. And so um, the thing we don't realize is that our thoughts are happening subconsciously. There's kind of this running dialogue in our brain that's judging neutral circumstances as positive or negative, good or bad. And that editor is running in the background often without being challenged jumping to conclusions, creating stories about situations, whether it's he's really nice or he's ignoring me or I screwed that up or this team is resistant to change. Those are all kind of judgments and um, assumptions we're making about circumstances that, and, and they lead to emotion. And so the theory and practice of emotional intelligence really start with an awareness of these thoughts and the connection to emotion. And following awareness is management. So by questioning and disputing your thoughts, you can manage your emotion and uh, create results that serve you. And so the phrase don't be so sure applies not just to problem solving um, in terms of improving a process, but to our emotional intelligence. Don't be so sure really applies to that running dialogue inside your brain. Is it really true that um, this person is resistant to change? Is it really true that they're ignoring you because they haven't responded to your email? When you learn to pause and question those thoughts and assumptions, there's often a realization that what we were telling ourselves isn't true. Um, or even if, or that there's another uh, thought or story that's equally as true. And so we can actually choose to think about circumstances differently. But we don't realize any of this because we transition from thought, emotion, behavior, like in less than a second. Our amygdala, which is that lizard brain, um, gets hijacked and we skip right over our prefrontal cortex that does all the thinking and problem solving and go to emotions really quickly. So when, when this sticker is saying, don't be so sure, test your ideas, 
uh, positive psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy, emotional intelligence, they're all saying question your thoughts. Don't be so sure about your thoughts, especially because they are creating the results that you have in your life now. So our brain doesn't always serve us. Um, jumping to conclusions is really good for survival. And when someone's veering into our lane, when we're going down the highway, but not great for solving problems and not great for managing emotion. So the Toyota Kata model is really created to offset our weaknesses around jumping to conclusions. The emotional intelligence, positive psychology models are really designed to slow down that process to increase awareness and management between thought, emotion, and behavior. And so Marty, Martin Seligman is kind of the father of positive psychology, and he created this ABCDE model to use to dispute your thoughts. And so the first three steps are really about awareness. So there's some situation that happens um, that's you know, the facts of a situation that 20 people in a room could agree on. And then the B is your belief. So how do you think about and interpret that event followed by a consequence? So you have a feeling or and a behavior that's a result of that thought. But then the D is disputation. So it's really a step to pause and dispute your thoughts and interpretation to argue with yourself about is it really true? And then E is energization, the outcome after you redirected your thoughts and, and um, uh, chose to think about that situation differently. So now that we've covered kind of the overlap between questioning thoughts and ideas, let's apply the two models uh, to a personal development challenge. So when it comes to the improvement of self, there are a whole lot of shoulds out there, a lot of messages about um, who we ought to be as um, leaders, as, as parents, as in relationships, et cetera. So personally, I speak for myself as a business owner, um, a daughter of aging parents and a wife, a mother of two adolescent girls, there's all kinds of expectations around whether it be exercise or being fully present or engaging with friends, um, home improvement, attending everybody's activities, reading the newest books, having an opinion on all the presidential candidates, um, keeping up with current events, um, family dinners, making sure everybody's eating healthy. At work, there's hundreds, if not thousands of books on leadership about how to be a better leader. Change management, active listening, um, improv for leaders, lean for startups, team dynamics, crucial conversations, five dysfunctions of a team, the Disney way, the Ritz-Carlton way, conflict resolution, crucial conversations, how to improve your culture, how to display Deploy strategy, Brene Brown's new book about bringing vulnerability into our work as leaders and empathy. And so in addition to all these helpful suggestions about how to do a better job at work, most of you probably have some type of performance review, which is another list of gaps to close, whether it be be more organized or better job meeting deadlines or communicate more effectively or improve your presentation skills, prioritizing your work, putting the customer first. So there's all kinds of messages about who we ought to be or the ought self, who you should be. But one of the most motivating ingredients for change is motivation. And it turns out we're not really motivated by weaknesses. They kind of create stretch, stress and defensiveness in ourselves. And we need um, positive emotion and a goal that's connected to our ideal self instead of who we ought to be. So instead of thinking about um, who you should be, it can be much more motivating to strive for goals that relate to something you really care about. So evidence from Case Western really talks about when goals are conceived from a positive perspective, they're more motivating and emotional commitment comes when we strive for goals and dreams that are connected to values that really represent our true and ideal self. And for lean practitioners, that's an exercise that we always used to do when starting a new team is what is the ideal process? You know, what does perfect look like? And that becomes kind of a motivating um, point to strive for. So in the book, Resident Leader by Richard Boyatzis, he has some exercises about finding your ideal self. And one of them is all about understanding your values. And this can be kind of a tricky one because again, you sort of go to, well, my values are family and connection and community and whatever, but they go a lot deeper to really understand 
okay, list the 15 values that are most important to you and then narrow that down to five and then narrow that down to two. And then think about what are you passionate about? You know, what is your purpose um, in this world? What do you want your legacy to be? What would you do if you won the lottery and why? What is your dream job and why is that your dream job? What is your ideal life? What does your life look like in five years or 10 years or 20 years? Um, what are you doing during that time? Who, how are you spending your days? Um, how do you feel at the end of the day? And it, the exercise really served to disconnect you from what you think you want or what, you know, sort of society tells you you should want from what's really, really important to you. So that's the idea of setting that first step as a challenge should really be connected to you and your um, individual beliefs and values of, of self. And so the idea is, is then um, to pick one. So once you spend some time on your ideal self, pick one goal and set this um, as something to achieve. And so after you've really set your goal, again, personally and professionally, I encourage you to consider why you want it. And so it may seem obvious, um, but think about it anyway. What why is that specific goal important? So for me, when I started a business a year or so ago, I really wanted to be profitable. And when I dug into that a little bit and asked why I wanted, why this goal of X dollars in revenue was so important to me beyond, there's some obvious reasons about, of course, any business wants to be making money. But I realized that for me, this extrinsic reward really meant something in terms of I wanted to feel successful and smart and accomplished. And that I thought having this extrinsic um, profit um, goal, achieving that would make me feel all that. But when I kind of dug into my purpose and what I really wanted, the goals that I created were more about contribution, um, helping people and that kind of thing. So asking why helped me get to a goal that was a little more um, motivating and effective for me. But the other thing for me was about hope and optimism. So I knew that I tended to view things negatively and realized a more positive perspective um, would benefit me. So um, um, that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. But in addition to the why, think about your measurement. So how will you know you've achieved it? So I'm going to take you through an example. Prior to being an entrepreneur and a business owner, I was part of a process excellence team at Mercy Health in Muskegon in West Michigan, Muskegon, Michigan. And as part of that team, we created this goal. This is our team. Um, I'm no longer uh, working there, but this is a team I used to be part of. And we created this goal and it was to leave home or leave for home, leave work at the end of the day and head home feeling like we slayed it. And that was a challenge that we set for ourselves really in an effort to increase our own engagement. And this was a feeling we all wanted to create and, and I'm still striving um, to achieve that on a daily basis. And if you're not familiar with the term slay, which is kind of now sort of this has become part of kind of our pop culture vernacular, it was really about wanting to do our absolute best, wanting to feel like I did my absolute best, I did my best effort, you know, I'm, I killed it, I'm awesome. And it may sound overconfident or cocky, but that's not what we were going for. It really, the term embodied um, a combination of effort and confidence and optimism. And the why for me on this, and this was, we had these bracelets made, which I'm wearing mine today would say, slayed it. So um, we all got these as kind of a representative of this is what we were going for. And I wasn't really looking, none of us were trying to feel happy all the time. But the phrase I knew I really slayed it today, I knew would fulfill itself. I hypothesized that this thought would lead to the emotion of being open minded, creative, interested in work and motivated um, to do what I needed to do to accomplish individual or group goals. So of course, step two of the improvement kata is to grasp your current condition and ask the question, who am I today in relation to the ideal? And in the case of personal development, of course, we can't go to a process and watch, um, but we can reflect on our own thoughts and our own emotions and our own interactions. And really the same ground rules of process observation apply, watching, watching your thoughts without judgment, gathering facts, seeking to understand. And so when um, starting this challenge, the focus process was really um, the job of the process excellence department at a community hospital. So 
we were charged with coaching leaders to think scientifically, to experiment, also to change their mindset such that they really believe that failure is a good thing. Um, focus on people, not results. Uh, experiment rapidly, coaching, not telling people. So we were trying to undo decades of socialization and all organizational and cultural norms through Toyota Kata coaching a few times a week. And the task felt huge and um, sometimes we left feeling defeated. So this was kind of my current condition. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as I thought through kind of my thoughts and emotions. So um, what the thoughts were, um, you know, that we weren't making progress, change wasn't happening quickly enough, people are resistant to change, or I'm doing a bad job. And then that created, because we know thoughts create emotion, that created the emotions in me, kind of feeling defeated, demoralized, frustrated, inadequate. And then that created my behavior, which was, you know, shutting down to some extent, giving up, decreasing my effort, because kind of feeling like I'm not sure it mattered anyway. So I really reflected on thoughts, emotions, and behaviors that were part of my current condition. But then I went on to, um, as I became aware of the thoughts, which were pretty negative, it was really time to question or dispute this thinking and, and asking, is it really true? So if we recognize that thoughts aren't facts and we remember that sticker, don't be so sure, is any of this really true? Is it true you're not making progress? Is it true that change isn't happening quickly enough? Is it true that people are resistant to change? Is it true that I'm doing a bad job? When I went through these individually, I realized that really none of them were true and um, I didn't have to believe them and they were creating emotions and behaviors that didn't align with what I was trying to achieve. So for my target condition, um, I set new thoughts. And so these were, you know, I'm making, um, I'm making a difference. I'm learning. Um, and the emotion I was trying to create was motivated, excited, optimistic. That's kind of what I was shooting for. And I was really working on picking a thought that would create that emotion because then the behavior I wanted was really effort and inspiration and creativity and kind of using a plan to actual reflection. So my measurement, um, I talked about measuring your progress towards the challenge. Um, my kind of outcome measurement was an end of day, like as you're walking out the door, do you feel like you slayed it? Um, yes or no? And then I uh, also did three, my sort of process measure was to try and do three written disputations. So really writing down and looking at negative emotion and thought and behavior and how those were connected at least three times a day. So that was my target condition. So for those of you familiar with Toyota Kata, you know that before we move on to experimenting, we have to understand the obstacles that are in the way between where we are and our target condition. And for me, um, in this case, it's not what's keeping you from um, operating according to the current condition or the target. It's what's keeping me from thinking according to the current according to the target condition. So the obstacles I had were we have this habitual response um, with no pause for my prefrontal cortex to think clearly. So I was going right to um, negative thoughts without even realizing it. it was just this automatic response. And so the second thing is I had a lot of thoughts around how people should be behaving. So, and, you know, leaders I'm coaching should listen to me. They should be getting it by now. They should be supportive of this change effort. But realizing that should thoughts are never very helpful. In the end, you're kind of fighting with reality because thoughts about how others should be behaving usually aren't helpful because you're just, it doesn't matter how they should be acting, that's how they are acting. And so accepting that and thinking about how you want to respond in kind is usually more productive. So from there, I started my first experiment. So my obstacle was this habit of a negative thought. And my first experiment was, um, is that when I had a negative emotion to pause and name it and think about the thought causing it and to write it down. So that was my first experiment is just 
to become more intentionally aware of thoughts causing negative emotions. And then once I, so then what I expected is that once I was aware of it, I would be able to really quickly change it to a positive and like circumvent the negative emotion. So what, what happened is, so I was have, having in this circumstance, having the emotion of frustration and annoyance. And my thought was, she isn't listening to what I'm saying this was, you know, someone I was coaching at the time, identified the thought as not helpful. I did realize that saying she, well, she isn't listening to me isn't helpful, but it was really hard to change it in the moment. So my awareness was in terms of what I learned, okay, it's great. I was aware of it, but it didn't lead to the ability to quickly change my thoughts. I had, I would have to practice. So that really took me to the next experiment. Um, and for that, I said, well, I really have to practice um, these new thoughts, just awareness alone. And that's really what Toyota Kata is all about, is practicing deliberately on an ongoing basis. It's just because we have awareness of that four-step pattern doesn't mean um, your brain doesn't automatically go back to jumping to conclusions, because that's like this hardwired circuit. So we have to practice new ways. So I was practicing these thoughts. I'm making a small difference. I'm learning. Those are my target thoughts. And I expected that this would become a habit. And so what happened is um, I often forgot about it. And I had to keep reminding myself to, to practice this new thought and repeat it in my head over and over again. And um, what I learned is it helped. It reminded myself, oh, whoops, um, reminded myself, uh, when, when I reminded myself of the thought, I kind of felt better and, and had more positive emotion. So what this really means is that I was doing what I was doing and what you can do is PDCA on yourself, really experimenting with your own thoughts and emotions to get different results. And, and this is a work example, but of course, it's completely applicable in, in any setting or relationship. Um, and it's very, this is a very different model and very powerful than, uh, much more powerful than typical approaches to leadership or, or personal development that focus, especially at work on classroom training or um, what your weaknesses are, or um, even if you know use a strength-based model, it doesn't involve practice and repetition. Um, or you know the performance improvement plan that tells you what all your gaps are usually isn't isn't motivated. But when you use the Toyota Kata model with this deliberate and iterative approach of learning in the reflection, writing it down um, with specific measures, it's much more disciplined and rigorous and effective at creating change, as well as bringing in this motivation piece, which is so important when you're striving not just for what you know, your company wants you to be or what your boss wants you to be, but who you want to be as an individual. And so here's a quick graph of my sleigh days that I was graphing over time. I've learned to create more and more of those as I work on, you know, positive thoughts and um, um, stories in terms of how I view and understand different circumstances. But and you might be thinking, well, who cares? You know, she feels great about herself, whatever. She has sleigh days. But Really, this positive emotion has a big ripple effect in, in my life and in anyone's life. It really leads, you know, as I said, to inspiration, creativity, and effort, and helps me get to my goal of contributing to our world, to helping people, as well as the positive emotion is contagious and creates more positivity in my encounters um, with other people as well. So in closing, um, I said, this is the key to the universe. I mean, kind of as a joke, but really I, I feel like this is so important to understand these two models that I just encourage you to think about that saying, don't be so sure and realize that you can actually choose what to think. Um, and that thoughts are not facts applies to the solutions that we want to put in place for all those processes at work, but it also really applies to the emotions and our behaviors. Um, and really pausing to think about um, the thoughts that are behind your emotions um, is very, very powerful in creating really different emotion, different behavior, and different results. And the good news is that all those thoughts that are wrong or, or unhelpful or untrue are completely optional. And so if you work to change these, you can create different um, emotions and behaviors and results in your life using the Toyota Kata practice routine. So thanks so much for listening. 
Thank you, Dorsey. Thanks yeah. for your thanks for your thought leadership and sharing your thoughts with us today. That was awesome. Oh, oh my pleasure. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, so, as mentioned earlier, you will receive an email shortly with the link to the recording. Um, please share this with those who you might find the information useful. And just a final reminder: visit leanfrontiers.com forward slash l a m s registration forward slash to learn more about the Lean Accounting Summit, which takes place September 11th through 13th in Austin, Texas. Thanks again, Dorsey, and thanks to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks.